right, welcome to another episode of Driving with Dave. I know what you're thinking, where's your guest? We're gonna get to that shortly. My guest today is Clayton Eckerd. He's a fantastic former Bachelor alum, lead and star of the show. He's online doing self-help and mental health seminars. You're really gonna like my conversation with him. But I wanted to let you know that the 70 plus minute conversation I had with him will not air in its entirety. Uh, due to both physical and financial constraints, Clayton and I both decided it'd be in both of our best interests to take that part of the conversation down as Clayton is in an ongoing court battle with someone regarding um, orders of protection, which means he doesn't want or feel comfortable now talking publicly about a court case he is in even though last week he would have been in the right to share this conversation out of respect for the court system and for the judge who issued that order of protection, it looks like we're gonna hold off from sharing that conversation. I still have it, I'm holding on to it. When the time is right, I will share it all with you. There'll be more to be said about this matter. But in the meantime, I assure you this conversation is great. The conversation I have with Clayton is about a guy overcoming his demons, overcoming uh, the scrawny, younger, inner child version of himself that existed, to being a walk-on athlete in college, and to then walking on and being a free agent in the NFL. Uh, it's a conversation about fighting really hard to get, uh, you know, to get your goals achieved in life, and it's a conversation about setback, one in which I'm sure he and I can both speak about. Uh, when the time is right. So anyway, I'm a real big advocate for transparency. I hate editing videos. You know me, I'd rather keep a mistake in there if I can. But for the sake of transparency, I'm letting you all know there's about 20 minutes of meat left on the bone, as it were, and of a conversation that you're not gonna quite be able to hear yet. Trust me, as I've edited this and shared it with some people, it is fascinating. You're gonna to have to believe me on that one. It is fascinating and it will come out in due time. What has happened since we had this conversation? Well, Clayton um, clearly had his uh, was in too deep and needed legal representation that he did not have. So I decided without any sort of, um, I don't know, push from anybody to start a GoFundMe. Several of us content creators were just thinking Clayton needs help. He needs financial help. So we started that GoFundMe and it raised $5,000 overnight and it's probably up to 6,000 or 7,000. And it's really just enough money to get him someone who can help him for a few days, get his truth out there in a legal setting. The day after starting a GoFundMe for Clayton, I received information that I'm gonna be served with paperwork uh, that will probably send me to court. Uh, is it justified? It doesn't matter. That'll be decided later on. Uh, this paperwork I'm receiving is from somebody I've never met, from somebody whose name I've never said out loud publicly, from somebody whose identity I've never revealed. They are a public figure, and it is in my belief that they're trying to use the court system to try to silence my opinion on the matter and also truth. What can be done about it? Well. Someone created a GoFundMe for me. It quickly raised four or $5,000. Who knows what it's up to by the time you hear this, but I will put both those GoFundMes in the comment section below if you, see, if you feel so inclined to donate. If you feel so inclined to just enjoy this conversation, hit the like button, leave a comment, and we'll be back with more right after this. All right, let's get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so excited today to talk to one of Bachelor Nation's royalties here and also a Airbnb entrepreneur. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Clayton Eckerd. One of the royalties, huh? That's, I, I think there's a lot of people that would maybe have uh, another say in that. You, I wouldn't even use that word for myself. Well, you don't need to because <laughs> we've etched you into the lore of the Bachelor world. Also, uh, a former NFL player, you got drafted by the Seahawks, do I have that right? I was not drafted, a free agent, and I tell everyone I had a cup of coffee because I call it for what it is. I was there for two months, I was there, um, but I ended up getting cut final rounds. Bro, you can season. downplay it, but that is, you got you, you cashed a check? Like I, they pay a couple all, small ones. A couple small checks. A couple checks. small ones, yeah, not, man, not the big NFL that, checks. 
that is a professional feat. And um, I, as a lowly, you know, high school quarterback, <laughs> respect. So how did you go? I remember when we first uh, found out you were going to be The Bachelor, we, someone dug up a high school yearbook photo. How do you go from high school Clayton to um, to a free agent who gets signed to a, like a practice uh, Seattle Seahawks? Like, oh, how, do you, how, do you, how, how do you go from there? Because you walked on in college, right? I walked on at Mizzou, yeah. Um, I had the right people in my corner. I think so much of my life, how I've been able to make it through certain chapters came down to the people that were around me and and in high school I had a coach coach Tom Sumner love that man to death he was like a second father um, and he was my lifting coach and so I worked out really hard at the gym um, you know for my entire four years of high school but I wasn't a good football player and I was a four-string quarterback freshman year I was on JV as a junior wide receiver while my brother was on varsity as a freshman two years younger than me um, so my senior year I we had a jamboree you know it's like a preseason game uh, where you're trying to prove yourself and I was thinking I was just going to be the backup get a little bit of playing time and coach Sumner pulled me aside and he said Clayton I've watched you work your ass off the last four years you are a good athlete you're really you're a very good athlete and I think you can be our starting defensive end so I told the coaches I want to play to place you as a starting defensive end to start this jamboree but you got to go out there now and play your heart out and be as good as I know you can be because I believe in you that was just like the most powerful moment, I think in one of the most powerful moments in my life because I didn't believe in myself in that moment, but he did. And so I went out there that day and I was like, I don't want to let down coach. I don't want to let him down. I don't want to embarrass him and for taking a chance on me. And so I went out there, played my heart out and played well, got the starting job. And then I had game film that year, which I could then go to Mizzou and uh, I presented the game film. And then from there, it was just, I'm here. So since I made it into the room, now I just, you know, until they kick me out, I'll just keep showing up every day. That's um, amazing. And I mean, was your high school that competitive that you, that you didn't get to start till your senior year? Uh, no, I just had a, um, you know, honestly, I had a sense of entitlement. Uh, I can think back to it. It's, it's, it's easier to obviously talk about things when you're we're far removed from them. But my junior year, I was a wide receiver, and I thought I, be I was better than what I was. And I was one of the taller guys on the team. I was much skinnier, but I went into my senior year, and I just had that thing. I was like, I should be starting something. Um, and you know, that I exuded that outwardly that mm -hmm. I was like, I should be something, some starter. And you, you know, the coaches could feel that. And, uh, and whenever I didn't get my way, I would get upset and it would be, I'd visibly make it known. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that it was a matter of like, well, I don't want to, you know, maybe give this guy a chance because he feels he deserves it without having put in, put in the work. So, but it was good because it really forced me to have to put in more and more work to prove myself. And thankfully, when someone gave me the chance that from that point forward, I was like, OK, I need to prove it. Like you can talk all you want and you can look the part, but you got to be the part. Yeah. You know, it's about sort of maturing at that right moment where I know kids, kids I played Little League with that could hit the ball like as far as grown men and they never, they almost like plateaued too early. Mm -hmm. Whereas it seems like you had this ax to grind, kind of like, you know, the, the Tom Brady vibes that everyone wishes to have, which is. Yeah, I was a late bloomer with, with football. I mean, I yeah didn't start to my senior year of high school and then uh, you know, I walked on at Mizzou and um, I thought I was going to get cut like the first week because uh, I'll never forget one of my coaches, and I think he's great too, but one, I, I uh, went in, it was like the second day of practice, and I did some type of pass rush move, and he goes, Clayton, you ever played it down to football in your life before? I said, uh, yeah, coach. He goes, couldn't tell. <laughs> I walked away, and that night I called my parents. I said, I don't think I'm going to be on the team for long. Um, but, you know, then I just kept showing up, and I was like, all I can do is work harder than the guy next to me, and hopefully they'll keep calling me back. So... Uh, I had a lot of growing up to do, do though, even as of recently, I, I thought like before leading up to the show, I thought going on to it that, you know, I was established and I had a good job and I thought I had life figured out. And that was, you know, again, my ego stepping in thinking that I had arrived. And, uh, so many times in my life when I th just, when I think that I finally got to this place of I've done it, I've made it. It's like life just hits you with a curveball, and it's like you're nowhere close, man. You're 27, 28 years old, and you think you figured life out. Is that how you feel with your uh, TikTok dances that you've made it? <laughs> I mean, where do you go from there? That's a, I mean, no. So you not at all. I you know what's funny is uh, 
I mean, I just think it's fun. I love dancing. Aren't man. they fun? I, it's My wife way makes to... me do them, and I always begrudgingly do it. And afterwards, I'm like popping moves that weren't in the choreography. <laughs> well, you just get to it's a way, way to express yourself. It's a great exercise, and you know, and I love like what I've gotten. You know, from a feedback standpoint, people saying, you know, you putting this out there and being vulnerable. It's it's you know, it's really made me feel that I can go and put myself out there. And chase after my own hobby. I've had people say that, like watching my dance videos, you know, made them want to p- t- uh, pick up knitting. <laughs> like, because you, you, I love that you're so ex- enthusiastic about your hobby. So now I figured, like, I should go chase after my hobby. I had a few people message me and they're like, I started doing dance classes, and I was so scared the first ten minutes, and then, you know, I got over it. And now I love it. You know, I talk about that because I was just reviewing the game tape of my first. Dance, my wedding dance mm-hmm. and we hired a professional to like walk us through it yeah. and it's one step at a time you don't think you can learn something when you see like a 60 minute TikTok or whatever but you learn one move at a time mm-hmm. it's that it, I think it's all myelin right it's the enzyme in your neural pathways that hardens when you do something that's what muscle memory is right mm-hmm. yeah. and so what was it football that gave you that growth mindset that you go, all right, I've proven I can put the time in here so let me do it there and Absolutely, or was yeah. it like how did Bachelor sort of um uh, test those waters. Yeah, I really think, I mean, I, football was my identity for so many years from 12 years old up to 23. And so, you know, that, that developmental stage where I'm learning about who I am and what I want to do in life, you know, everything was centered around football. And what I loved about football was there's an individual and a team element. There's an individual element where you can push yourself harder and harder in the gym. You can do one more rep. Um, you, then your nutrition matters. You know, you're, are you getting enough rest, recovery, um, studying game film? You know, to, to be better than the the guy across the line from you. Um, there is that individual component where, at the end of the day, for me to stick in college football, for them to keep calling me back, I had to perform at a certain level, and that was all on me. And so I love that because it was about pushing my limit. And uh, but then there's the team element too. So it's it's when you lose, you're not a loser. And that's what I loved about football and sports in general is that failure is nothing more than a lesson learned. Failure is nothing more than just battle testing you for the next battle, right? Like life is all about ups and downs. There's the peaks and valleys. You can't win every single day. And what I loved about football was that we would lose, but just because we lost didn't mean that we were losers. And I thought that was so important for life because I'm like, I will lose from here on out. I will fail in life, but I'm not a failure unless I believe I am. But yeah. if I just keep failing and learning and don't repeat the same mistake twice, then I'll ultimately succeed. Yeah, it's and like reprogramming, you know, down the bumper lane. Like, all right, that's not it. Let's try this. Yeah. Now, now, obviously, you, you on your season of The Bachelor were criticized for, you know, decisions you made to mm-hmm. talk to your finalists openly to each other. Things that the audience watched back as some sort of like, kind of like, oh my gosh, how could he be how could he think to do that yeah. but obviously your moral barometer is trying to do the right thing so what was it like uh, getting the feedback that audiences didn't like the direction you went and did you think they would did you think watching back that you were like all right i, I handle myself and then all of a sudden you watched it and that's not how it went yeah that's a great question so i um definitely was expecting a little bit more should I put it? Grace? Maybe grace. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was maybe expecting a little bit more grace. <laughs> Not when, <in> this town. <laughs> when I, when I, when the show aired, um, I didn't expect that type of negativity. And so the first thing that happened was because there was the expectation versus reality. There was, there was a conflict between the two. So I was going in there thinking, oh, people will understand. Um, and, and, and once they, they'll figure it out, I'm like, yeah, maybe it wasn't the best decision, but we get it. Well, it seemed to be met with a lot of you know, uh, you know, anger and, and 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 a lot of disagreements, and people were were not on my side. It seemed like there was a large portion of people that were against what I was doing. So, my ego, unfortunately, we all have one. There's good and bad sides to it. But I went on the defense, and then I went on this you know whole explanation tour, mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm just going to keep explaining, and eventually everyone will come around. But I kept explaining, explaining, and it wasn't getting me anywhere. And then I went through a period of being angry, and I'm like screw everyone that watches this show you know they're all just i mean i seriously i was like they're all just stupid like i was getting so defensive and i was pointing the finger at everybody else being like they're all the problem it's not me and then one day i had i read a comment online and seriously it's so powerful how one conversation one comment can change the total trajectory of your life and this comment 
you know, you know, said, uh, I understand what Clayton's saying. I get where he's coming from. But what bothers me is that he continues to explain he hasn't once taken accountability for the pain that he caused. And it just hit me. It was like this light bulb moment that I realized I, I've already explained myself enough, but I haven't taken any accountability. And that's what it's all about. I hurt these women and I keep trying to explain my intentions, but it was perceived this way and it caused tears and they were real and the emotions hurt people. And I should have just said, I'm sorry for hurting you. But that was a issue with taking accountability. Um, and my ego didn't want to do it because I felt attacked, you know, on every corner. And, uh, so I wasn't able to like actually own up. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to own up when you're in that, that fight or flight moment. Yeah. So like, I, I, I personally think you're too hard on yourself, but I, oh, I understand am. that yeah. because I'm the same way. I beat myself self up over decisions myself, but then I give other people the grace that I wish I would be given myself. Yeah. And I think that what it comes down to is like everyone's trying the best with the information they have. And a lot of people still watch the show thinking that there, there, there's no nuance to it. And, and the truth is, is like, there's a story being told you're in heightened conditions and you know, shit doesn't always go perfectly. I think you're hard on yourself, but I understand it. It's, it's like, no one really knows what you're going through and you're trying your best. And in explaining yourself, people just, especially online, they don't want to hear it. How, what was the sort of, um, how did you digest other commentators and other alumni criticizing you? Did that hurt worse than the strangers? Oh, another great question. Uh, I honestly haven't been asked that yet. So I'm just, uh, what I love is now is I just answer based off the first thing that comes to mind, right? Cause that's the authentic thing. The first very first thing that pops up. So I would say, yes, I was hurt a little bit more by the alum that spoke up because I thought due to us having a shared experience, they would have a greater understanding of what I had been through mm. and therefore they would give me more grace. But some of them uh, seemingly to me appeared more critical. And what frustrated me was it, I thought that they were critical for no other reason than their own personal gain. It wasn't a matter of, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to see eye to eye with him. It's I need to capitalize on this, so I'm going to produce a hot take. And what frustrated me with some of the individuals that commented was they know the ins and outs of it all. Mm -hmm. And... But when they were commentating it, they acted as though none of that existed, in my opinion. Like how the edit goes and the things that they just, you know, you're not what, to it talk all about. goes, yeah, what all goes into it. And I would get frustrated because I'd hear them talk and I'm like, you know, there's more to this story, but you're acting as if you don't know. And I got frustrated by some people that were acting high and mighty. You know, they, they provide their opinion and it's, and I'm like, okay yeah, you've learned because you've been around this long enough. But if I rolled the tapes back on you, you made mistakes as well. I, and I just don't like the whole, to me, if you've been through a similar experience, I don't like it when individuals try to show that they're bad. They were better. Well, when I was on, I did this, you know, and this is what I would have done. It's like, sounds like we're talking about Nick Vial. I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> names. I just, no, but I, and that's why I call them up from a neutral side. I go, I'm not, I haven't been in either position, but your shit stank. His shit stinks. Maybe we're just in a scenario where your shit stinks. My, and my frustration is, is you can provide your own opinion. I don't have a problem with that. And Nick called me out at one point and he said, I lacked empathy. And I remember I get so frustrated. I'm like, who, who are you? Like, who do you get to say that I lack empathy? But then I started to listen to some of the things he was saying and there was some validity to it. And so, you know, I could take constructive criticism once my ego calmed down and I was like, okay, just try to listen because what some people are just saying things that aren't constructive at all. And, and those you can pass off, but there is some truth to the things that people are saying. You were not perfect when you went into that experience. You didn't handle yourself to the best of your ability. And because of that, now people have something to say. And there are some people that are just speaking to speak and they don't have really, there's nothing backing their, their arguments. Um, they just are producing hot takes and some people will believe it and it is what it is. And then there's other people though that are saying things that actually are valid and you can take and learn from their comment, uh, commentary. So yeah, like a broken clock's right twice a day. So even though Nick <laughs> might be hypocritical cause he was the same way, he can still, you can still do the work and look at yourself and go. Yeah. Well, and what I want to say about Nick is 
I do respect the fact that he is willing to, I, it depends how you look at it, but I do think sometimes he calls people out, but maybe you can call it, say it's holding people accountable. Maybe sometimes he's just producing a hot take, but at the end of the day, he's successful in his own realm. And I don't really gain anything by going after him. Um, you know, are there things that he's done that I don't like? Absolutely. A thousand percent. I've, there's some hot takes or th- comments he's made where I'm just like, dude. But what's tough is that you can be in his position and we use him because him, Caitlin, and a few are like top dogs. They came out of the show during the sort of, you know, highest earner potential time of the show and then can sort of like roll on that wave. Whereas guys like you come out of it and probably don't get a lot of what you were promised. Was that, was there a bitterness to be like, oh yeah, no, I got to go back to another job because it doesn't, you know, pay the bills to get, you know, uh, oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. Treated this way. Yeah. I was told I, there was going to be a lot of things that happened or were going to happen that never did. And you feel lied to. So you all of a sudden are like, what is my reality? If, if all these things that I was told haven't occurred, then is that because I was just flat out lied to, or is it a, uh, is it a change of the times? Um, I think it is. I think it was more so a change of the times. I don't think anybody now that I look back at it, I mean, people are getting tired of influencers. There's an oversaturation, you know, there's three different seasons every year for, I don't even know at this point how many they're packing in, but Netflix introduces a litany of dating. Well, yeah, I'm just talking, yeah, from strictly from the bachelor world, but there's like so many influencers. And I think, you know, a couple years ago at the peak, there weren't as many. And so everyone was fascinated by, you know, the show and everyone followed them and you see it now that there are less and less followers for the leads. Uh, I mean, I have very few followers compared to previous leads. Zach after me had very few followers. And then right now, you know, Joey doesn't have that many followers either. It compared to people from the past. I think people are just growing tired of influencers and, and they're like, I don't care to follow them. So, um, you know, that's just a change of the times. I don't think I was lied to. I think a lot of people that told me what was gonna happen were like, oh, I guess not. Yeah, yeah, two years ago that was the case, yeah. and then things kind of just dipped. TikTok got popular. It's, everything's just kind of fragmented. But what I like is is I, I I agree that the world is oversaturated with influencers. But I think if you're not rudderless with your platform, that that um, it can be very valuable. So you've picked up uh, the mental health aspect. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how it, did you have any idea that this would be a realm you'd be going into, or is it a product of learning through the hardship i know without a doubt in my mind that i would not have been so outspoken on mental health had i had a typical happy ending on the show it was everything that i went through to take me to one of my lowest points in my life where you know i i embarrassed myself i wasn't happy with what i put out there for everyone to see and I then just said, you know what, I'm going to start trying to be better because partly that was, it was twofold. One, I mean, I always have been my biggest critic, but I do put a lot on my shoulders because I expect more out of myself because if I don't, who else will? Right. And so I was like, you know, I'm just going to try to be better. And then I thought, well, I just want to share, I have this platform I went from having a thousand followers before the show to 300 plus at the peak. And I thought, you know, I, I don't want to waste this. There are people that would be so grateful to have a platform like this, but I want to like use it for good. I don't want to just be showing myself partying. You know, I want people that are following me to like get some value out of it. Mm. Then I found that, well, okay, I'm going through this mental health journey. I want to share this with others. And it was therapeutic for me because as I, release things it helped I you know I would think of them before I'd release them therefore like I was spending time working upon myself and coming to these conclusions and and then I shared these thoughts and uh, it helped me express myself outwardly um, as opposed to harboring in the emotions and so uh, I ended up really enjoying it but it's fascinating too how uh, you know I I did struggle at first with coming to terms with the fact that Everyone followed me, most people, they followed me for me being the bachelor, but also me and my relationship with Susie. And so whenever Susie and I would post, um, you know, these TikToks, voiceover type stuff, we would get 
I don't know, 30,000 likes or whatever. And I, then I started posting on mental health and I would get like thousand. Mm. And I, I remember there were multiple times where I was like, I'm going to just stop posting and get off social media because I was so bothered by the contrast between the, you know, a thousand likes on my mental health post and the 30,000 likes on, you know, a Susie and my post about. So the it's voiceover. like a bitterness that the actual topics of substance don't generate what the gossip generates. Well, and yeah, and I would, and that, yes, exactly. One, one part of it was, I thought this is what matters. This is, these are actually important discussions and no one cares. And then when I, I started placing value upon likes and I, and I almost got, I almost quit. Mm. Like st- I almost stopped posting altogether because I was like, you know what? Clearly nobody cares about me sharing about my mental health. So I'm just going to stop. There's no value here. Also, you're opening your soul it to not feel be, like you're being heard when you're being real authentic. It's like a dismissal of your authenticity almost. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it just felt like I was being invalidated. And of course my head was in the wrong place, but it, it I, I took that as, but we're trained to think that way. Right. Like, well, so we, it's okay. But like, we take you, all these performance metrics and that's typically like, I mean that there's, there is truth to that. Go online and you see if someone has a lot of likes, it's because a lot of people like it. Something about that video makes people want to click like, so it's, it's a performance metric. And so you look at that and go, okay, well, if this doesn't match the other performance metrics and there's something about this video that did not catch people's attention. Um, and, so what I, what I realized though, is I got to a point where I'm like, you know what, quit focusing on the likes. I, I remember I was, at one point I was so embarrassed. I almost hid my likes and I know people that do do that mm-hmm. because they don't want people to know actually how few likes they're getting. You feel like a, a post bomb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because they, they, they think people will look at that and go, wow, that's, that's embarrassing. Yeah. Three, 300 likes and you have, you know, a million followers. You must be buying followers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I remember there was that point where I almost thought about hiding my likes, but then I, I was like, no, Clayton, you are really doing this for the, like, you are getting way too overwhelmed by something you can't control. Post what is authentically you. And then if you get 300 likes, that's still 300 people that you're touching. Plus, whoever, you know, I, I mean, I'm a, I do this too. I watch videos and I laugh. I'm like, that was a great video. And I don't even click like, <laughs> I just scroll yeah, past yeah, yeah. it. You and assholes out there. Hit I don't, the like I don't know button. why I do that, but I'm like, I'll sit there and watch it. Uh, yeah, like clip. you're the arbiter. You're like, that deserves a like. Yeah. And then sometimes I was like, that was a really great video. And I'll scroll past it. And then every, I'll be like, you know, what? I gotta stop doing that. I gotta support these individuals. The, but that, you know what though? The, the algorithms now half what? my audience isn't subscribed. YouTube knows who to show it to. Well, and so that, so, again, these yeah. are, that's bigger than, you know, again, the <clears> algorithms, <throat> they, they all can figure out what, but yeah, as, as an athlete, you're, you're kind of driven by stats. I've always been driven by numbers. Me so too. I would over analyze numbers and look at them and you know i remember again i got so obsessed with the numbers coming off the show where um you know i would i could tell you how well a post would perform in the first two minutes oh yeah because i, I would look yeah. at, to, at the view to like ratio and then i would see that ratio and i would go okay if it was over a point what was the number it's like a 0.05 it would do well if it's like down in the 0.03 range it's not going to do well and i would analyze it and i would just watch the numbers rack up and yeah i mean you, you get obsessed but how great is that when it takes off? Well, that's, that's a problem. It's, it's that's a dopamine curse. hit. It's, it's a dopamine You're hit. You're like, it's, let's you get, go. And so I, I got so obsessed coming off the show because I wasn't used to it. I wasn't used to I never really posted. I posted maybe once every two months on Instagram. Mm. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I, I'm posting and I'm seeing a thousand likes pop up in the first five minutes and you're just like, you can just feel it. Yeah. It's just like no. charging your soul and you're like, oh, and you're like, this can't awesome. be good. And you're <laughs> seeing how many comments are just flying in and you're like, man like this is but then on the flip side that post viral video like i'm gonna go walk around and read some comments like yeah it's addicting yeah that's why they the apps uh uh what is that netflix documentary it's incredible it's um oh the one the social dilemma yeah oh my gosh it's an incredible documentary but they made these apps to be addicting i'm just gonna plug this in while we talk keep keep going so they made the apps to be addicting and that is where i fell victim to it I, i i started to base my importance around the amount of likes that I got on social media um, and yeah, the amount, amount of comments and there's what people were saying in general. And so I started to focus my entire importance on that or a lot of it. And uh, that was probably one of the most unhappiest points in my life that I had because I was just living my entire life online. Imagine the kids though that don't, you're, an, you're a smart adult and, it, and it's still hard to figure this out. But imagine the kids out there that have no idea that this, that they're so trained by their phones to like oh yeah be yeah. consumers of just so much junk and that and it's like that's i think that for a lot of people i heard a 
I heard a psychologist on Caitlin Bristow's podcast and she said, hard stop. We can't even, she was like, I don't even discuss marriage counseling until we figure out the phone issues with couples. Because I mean, even with you and Susie, your, your life is dependent on in a, in a part of your livelihood on the phone, but then, then you, then you'll get stuck as a consumer and it's like your business in your office, in your pocket. And it's a real tough uh, negotiation when you're in a relationship and, and with your own happiness. Did you find now Susie's obviously an incredible content yeah. creator. Mm -hmm. Did you find it that you, it was hard to keep up with her or like, like how did, how did the social media aspect of your relationship play out? No, actually, um, well, at the time I felt that I had to, yeah, post a certain amount, but not because of her. I just was kind of watching her and analyzing and she's a natural and she's been doing it for years. And I felt in a way that I had to match that because I, I, I thought, okay, we both went through the same experience. And so I need to be this content creator uh, and do what she's doing, uh, because that's just what, you know, I have now this, this, this audience. And mm. so I need to, you know, I need to utilize it. Right. Cause again, like if I don't, I could just let it die, but there are people that would, that would love to have that many followers. So I felt like it would be a waste to just let it die. So I started to compare myself to her and her content. Well, she had really great content and she loves social media. I don't really love it. I think it's a great tool, but I would, you know, if you gave me multiple millions of dollars, I would probably hop off social media or you'd maybe hear from me once a month. Like I would rather not be attached to technology. Mm. I I'm happiest when I'm not on tech, you know, when I'm not online. And so, but yeah, I, I was comparing myself and because of that, I, I felt, you know, I would get upset and I was like, man, I don't, I don't want to be in this constant content creation state of mind, but no, Susie was super supportive and was always willing to help me and, and was giving me a ton of ideas. And the greatest thing, well, there's many great things from our relationship, but she, you know, really helped me start to chase my passions and be able to make them um, profitable to a place where I could chase them and not have to run back to medical sales. I liked medical sales. I did it for five years, but I didn't love it. And so she wanted you to, she wanted you to like boost your qualitative side of things, like not worry, like just put out more content that was authentic. She just knew that my passions in life for wellness and mental health, physical wealth. And so she, she, or physical health. And so she said, you know, you should do like a, an online coaching business. And I was like, Oh, I don't, know. I don't even know where to start. And she's like, well, copy genius, go online and like find people that have made su success out of it and just copy it. And so I, I went on, I started looking at it, building some stuff and I launched it, but I launched it super quick. She was like, don't, do you feel like you should market it more? I said, no, I'm just going to launch it. You know, I was like, I have this many followers. I'll launch it. I'll probably get this many people to sign up. And the first time I launched it in a rush, even though she, she, she supported me, but she's like, you sure you want to launch it? I was like, yeah, I'm gonna launch it. I launched it. I had two people sign up, mm -hmm. two people sign up. It was like $30 workout plans. And I was just, I, my first thought was, no, not, it's, this isn't meant to be. I'm, yeah, I'm remember, running back to medical sales. Remember you said it cost you X amount of money and a month's worth of time. And well, so I, I just, I was like, I'm, that's it. I'm going back to medical sales. And she knew in my heart that like, I wanted to do this. I just didn't do it to the best of my ability. And so she goes, Hey, this wasn't, wasn't the launch you thought you wanted to be, but did you really give it everything that you could have given it? And I was like, I mean, I did this and this. She goes, I know you did all of that, but like, could you have done more? I was like, well, yeah, you can always do more. She's like, how about you do more for another month? She's like, can you trust me and just go through this process again? And then if it fails, you can go to medical sales. Wow. And how valuable to have someone that you trust. And so I did, I was like, I'll do it. Um, okay. And I, we went through, we, we were posting, 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 you know, a couple workout videos. We got my mom involved on one of them. And then I relaunched and I got like 80 clients in the first week. Amazing. And it was a subscription base and I, I was able to live off of that income for the first, you know, six to eight months, just that alone. And it was only because of her, because if I would have just not listened to her, I would have ran right back to corporate. And now here I am, I'm two years removed from my corporate job and I am still able to make a living with what I've built from my online following and, and chasing after my mental health speaking and all that. But I wouldn't have been able to speak on mental health if I was in an OR all day mm. working in medical sales. So I attribute so much of me chasing my passion to Susie. She was so good for me. She was the right person 
for me at that stage of my life. Obviously, we're not together. We were, we're not meant to be each other's forever person. But I do believe that people come in and out of your life at the right times. And she was meant for me more than anybody else was in that moment of my life. You know, again, very graceful uh, considering, you know, it's a former partner. We don't always see that in the bachelor world. But yeah, it's almost like she was able to, it's almost like when you ride a wave, the difference between riding the wave and not is so, it's so minute. It's little changes. So the fact that she was there to push you to like recalibrate really goes to show that you were, you know, like I always say, the brick wall wasn't meant to keep you out. It's meant to show you how bad you want something. Mm -hmm. So at first you're like that brick wall, I can't get over. And then you're like, all right, let's build a ladder. Yeah. And that's really cool to see that she was able to help you with that. She was one of my first guests on this show, which was really special because it kind of validated the show to like other alumni and stuff, which is really big. And of yeah. course you're our second lead to come on after Katie Thurston. But I'm assuming just from my, as an audience that she broke up with you, was that a mutual decision or were you the type who was trying to fix things? Um, you know, it was, it was pretty mutual. Um, I think she saw the writing on the wall before I did though. Okay. I, I really, really wanted it to work really badly. Um, and because again, she changed my life for the better. And she did, there was so much good that she brought and, and, and every time I, you know, was around her, I wanted to be a better person. And I just remember telling people that they're like, what is it about her? I'm like, every time I'm around her, I learn something. And like, she makes me want to be a better human being. And when you find something like that, you don't want to lose that. And, you know, we we weren't compatible in a lot of ways, but I felt that there were a lot of things that we did mesh on. And so, and, but just, I, there's very few people that I've met where I've felt that way. And so I was like, I don't want to lose this. Like you make me a better person. And, and it's like, she's your only stability post show. Like she was like the only, she understood me because when no one else did, because she was right there alongside me. Mm -hmm. And so that was where like we, trauma bonded in a way, but she was my support. And I didn't want to lose that because I, I was afraid that when, if I lost her, I would feel lost. And, but then I realized that I was hurting her more by keeping her around. And, and that's where, um, you know, we finally had a discussion and, and I just said, I just, I, I feel like I can't hold you around like here any longer. Like you're, you're, I'm watching you start to break down. And a lot of my pain was wearing on her and she took it on herself and she would try to try to be there for me. But then at some point she needed to be there for herself mm. and I couldn't be there for her because I was so worn down and beat up that I just had no energy left to give. And, uh, and it just got to that place where the, the breakup, it was sad. I mean, I remember the last night we, you know, we, uh, we had a great time together. It didn't feel right. It was weird. I, uh, we, we, she just got a projector in, uh, that she bought. And, and, uh, so we put on the projector, we ordered a bunch of pizza and we just, you know, laid there and watched TV or watched a movie all night and, and cried and laughed. And, um, and then the next day I woke up at 5 AM and hugged her and just thanked her for everything and, and drove off, you know, cross country. Wow. And it, it was the weirdest thing because there was so much love there. And I had no ill will feelings towards her, but I just knew, and she knew that we just can't continue this because yes, we were each other's support, but at this point we're only going to recover and thrive separately. That's really special to hear because you just don't hear those stories too often. Um, why did you choose off the vine with Caitlin Bristow to, to like, like why did you guys choose to do a conversation together post breakup? Because, of Caitlin's authenticity. Um, I trusted her and I still trust her. I think she is, I'll be honest with you. She really shocked me. Um, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover, but we all inevitably do it from time to time. And I knew nothing of Caitlin. And when she first came on my season of the bachelor, I just thought she was going to be maybe a little pompous. I thought she'd be a little full. Yeah. Full of herself. I, I just, I, I just thought that, you know, I didn't know anything about her, but um, outside of just like having seen pictures of her. Um, and then she showed up and I remember like we, we were, we met in this like back room before, like in this theater and 
she goes, how you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm good. She goes, no, 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 like, how are you really doing? And it just, in that moment, I'm like, oh, wow. She's like really asking how I'm doing, like in general. Like, mm -hmm. She's just, hey, that's a mental health check. And she was like. Yeah, off the clock, not yeah, on camera. Yeah, no cameras around at all. And mm -hmm. and I, I, I was like, and so I kind of opened up a little bit. And um, I'll never forget, producers came in, like, hey, we're about to roll in five. Um, and she, she goes, okay. And then they walk away and she's like, we can sit here as long as you want and talk. She's like, well, they'll start when we're ready. And, uh, and, and, and I knew that she had a ton of respect for the film crew and all that. It wasn't that she was saying like, listen, like everyone waits on us. Her whole point, I think in that moment was to say, listen, this is important get it right that you're, first. that you're able to like get out what you need to right now. And just know that I'm here to listen to you until you are done talking. And that was just such a powerful moment for me where I'm like, wow, this girl is incredible. And then she checked in with me so many times as the show was airing and then post-show. I mean, she would text and text and text her and I'll also say uh, Becca Kufrin. Those, oh, yeah. Those two would text me consistently and just check in. Hey, just want to see how you're doing. And and I was I, I'm like this shows how true they're like how, how truly authentic they are and how great of human beings. Especially they are. considering, yeah, I mean, it's like we always say it, it's what what's done behind the cameras where you really get to learn about somebody. Mm -hmm. So so I guess you're saying you think Caitlin Bristow would be a good partner. I think Caitlin Bristow has so many incredible qualities about her. I mean, she is um, you know she's very sweet. She's she she will listen. She sits there and she's a very attentive listener. Um, she won Dancing with the Stars. Now you're dancing. She's very talented. You see where I'm going with this? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> you like Nashville? You know, honestly, Nashville's a big. By the way, Nashville. <laughs> a big bachelorette party spot. Yeah. Well, now that you now that um, you got the Bachelorette Airbnb empire. You know, uh, you well, expand. yeah. Well, that's that's uh. So I, I was talking to my wife about. I'm not going to let you. I'm going. <laughs> I was talking to my wife about that. I was like, Clayton's got a great deal with this, like showing up to the Bachelor your bachelor airbnb i was like you're gonna have to triple your rate so you can make it to well, all your other franchises that you open up. i'll say this it's not a it's not going to be marketed as a bachelor airbnb anymore um no you got to cease and desist from uh, them. i'll just say this i <laughs> nobody is above the rules including me and you need I, to use a, a carnation instead of a rose <laughs> i will just say this I wow. never try to be a nuisance and I respect everybody for, and for what people have provided me. I mean, I'm very grateful for being chosen to be the bachelor. Like they could have picked anybody else. Gosh, but they're still fucking with you though. Well, I, you know what? I get at the end again, I'm not above. It's legal. It's anything. corporate. I'm not above anything. And I sign contracts and you know what? I'm not above them and I have to abide by them. And I ultimately am grateful and I still I have an Airbnb and I'm still going to be able to meet people and hang out and say hello and have a ton of fun. Oh, yeah. You can still do appearance fees. Well, I got to figure out how exactly I'm going to work things. But at the end of the day, I don't want to, you know, I am just very grateful for what I have been given. And if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. And so I. How, how have sales been? Um, you know, I've got an initial interest. I, again, I, it's been, I, I, I took it down right now, but I'll put it back up. And you're still under construction. You just started the, yeah, the yeah. I mean, you know, I, I said, Hey, here's my Airbnb, but it's not gonna be ready till February 1st, potentially. So, you know, a lot of people are like, well, I want to book this and I've gotten good interest. I mean, I'm, Oh, very, the internet loved the idea. Well, and people I'm, like, I'm very, this is a deal. I'm very pleased with, again, like the fact that again, I have an audience. I'm grateful for that. There are a lot of people that have Airbnbs and don't have an audience to launch that to, you know, I had hundred thousand views in, in under 24 hours. Like that is the marketing again, that I was blessed with because of my appearance on TV. That's you know, people pay, pay so much money to have that. And so I look at it like, look, and, but also you're, you, you, you went through the ringer, the show made a ton of money off of you. So like anything legally that you want to do to profit off it, I'm all about people doing that because in the end they're not, they're not losing money by having you be their bachelor. They're printing <sighs> money. You, well, you know what? Again, I read the fine print and I, I just, at the end of the day, I, the rules are rules. And, um, I am very blessed that I do feel that I have a great working relationship with the show, with the producers. I mean, I, I still text them, you know, they, they'll check in with me. And at first, of course, like the way that I, you know, when I came off the show and people perceive me in a certain way, what does your ego first do? It goes on the defense and then you go into attack mode and you're like, well, this is all your fault. So there was a point where I absolutely, I hated the pr producers. I hated everything about the show mm. because I was like, look what you did to me. But 
it's so easy to say, look at all the bad, but then you take credit for all the good. Mm. So there were a lot of things that, again, the show, they chose me. They didn't have to choose me. Mm. They could have chosen anybody else. And as far as why they chose me, I don't know. I mean, that's not my, for me to answer, but the point is they chose me. They blessed me with the opportunity and my life is forever changed because of it. Again, it's still like, I have to give credit to the show. I wouldn't be chasing my passions. If it was for the show, I'd be working still in medical sales, which again, it's a great job. It just wasn't my true passion. Um, and maybe I'll do it down the road, but, but you know, I get to chase my passions right now. Yeah. That is because of the show. It's just a lot of times I think people would go and they come off the show and they're mad about their edit and they're like, screw them. And it's really easy to do that. But also it's like, but you're taking credit for all the good. Yep. So we like to take credit for the good, but not the bad. And I look at it silver lining. I'm like, you're very fortunate for still considering all that has happened. My life is still pretty damn blessed. Yeah. I mean, I look at it this similar way where I go, well, I'm able to make a good living commenting in this bachelor world uh because there's a loyal audience and that loyal audience will also scrutinize me wonder if my dog's got the right joint medication i mean you can't excuse me you can't do anything in this community the, without someone questioning but they're it. passionate but, and you know what i have been ripped to shreds by this this audience but i've also had my ass pulled out of some dates some crazy spots because of these investigative modes that these individuals get into. You don't say. And the, they're detectives, and I am forever grateful because I don't have the time in the day to go and do these things. And so, you, again, don't you don't burn bridges because just because some people they're passionate, at least passion drives action. Mm. And that's where the Bachelor Nation fandom like they are a passionate bunch it's like i got i got this buddy and he'll always try to start shit with me yeah and but like he's always instigating stuff like brotherly just always yeah and then if anyone else tries to mess with me he's got my back like that yeah and i kind of feel like bachelor nation is the same way yeah. now they're like we can make fun of him but you can't yeah yeah and and i've I'm, seen that i think it's hilarious and it's a little bit of um it's a little bit of like some fraternal uh hazing that goes on but you've overcome and reacted in a way that is seen as you know very very gracious and i think that that goes a long way now uh, full disclosure i was a little bit rushed for this interview okay. because i went to a pharmacy to try to buy you a dental dam that was my <laughs> i don't know if you know what this is but it was a gag gift pun intended I know what it is. and they were sold out and i'm thinking maybe they were sold out because of you maybe you <laughs> you popularized maybe that needs to be the big brand deal Oh, so man. I literally couldn't find one. I asked the guy and he's in the, he's in the uh, toothbrushing section. I was like, I don't think you know what a dental I is. I actually know what it is because of uh, college freshman year, I was in a freshman interest group and they brought in a sex expert um, and they pulled that out at dental dam. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. And they told me and uh, I was like, oh. I was like, that's uh, okay. That didn't realize that existed. Yeah, they sold like three in the history of the world. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. I've never, yeah. Of course, as, as you, if you can think of it, someone's created it. So you were la last, false... last year, you had to prove your innocence when you were accused of cheating on someone yes. on the other side of the country. You proved it within 48 hours, but it still required you, I mean, credit card receipts. It's, it's like, it was ridiculous. People weren't willing to believe you until you provided hard proof. Yeah. And, and it's, it's frustrating because you, get hit with a false accusation and you know the truth, but then you realize that if I'm, if I stay silent and that, that, you know, it's guilty until proven innocent. And so you kind of like, whenever something like that hits, you go, okay, is this going to get picked up or not? You're like in your PR state of mind. You're like, it's not true. So do I address it? Do I not? When, how? The Barbara Streisand effect, calling attention to it can make it worse. Yeah. But then, so of course, both but then you're the situations. victim because you're in the you're in the quiet. No one yeah. knows what you're going through. You know, you're trying the best with the info you have. Usually you mature with age, but with the way we're consuming content, I think we're regressing. So even some of these people that I'm sure you have a lot of bitterness towards or anger towards, I think if they had a quick sit down with the facts, they would change their tune. And I think that's the teachable moment to show like that we can have empathy for a guy, even if, even if he's six foot five and jacked, you're making me look very weak over here, brother. <laughs> well, but like just because you can bench press a lot of weight doesn't mean your mental health can take a harder uh, sort of metaphorical whipping than someone else's. Yeah, no, I do think that people look at me and, and I've seen this online. They say, 
he doesn't struggle with mental health. He's got it all. Look at him. He was he probably got all the girls back in college and whatever. And he was always a superstar athlete. And when I go and give mental health speeches, I show my seventh grade photo. I show my high school photos. You know, I was I was called big brother by all the girls. You know, in middle school through high school, no girl wanted to date me, and 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 so I didn't feel good enough. That's where that started to stem from. Me being a people pleaser was uh, when you're a kid, all you have is is sports and and friendships and relationships. So that's it. That's like you don't have a job, you don't have, you know, uh, you don't have like to pay bills, you don't have all these other things that adults have to so do. So like the social hierarchy was all you had. Yeah, and that's all I had. And so like again, I was friend zoned by all the girls that I wanted to date, and then I wasn't a good athlete till my senior year of high school. So I didn't feel like I had much value as a person and that is the person that I would see in the mirror when I look in the mirror so I built this up this image this I, I, I packed on all this muscle uh, you know I, I, I tried to be the best athlete I could be I tried to be you know uh, what I thought you know every woman would want to date uh, because I wanted to prove to people like am I worthy finally mm -hmm. and so I built up this image but now I'm being judged on the image that I built and people are like I don't feel bad for him like look like he's got it all and it's like that's ignorant because you don't know the full story like I don't like I'm I I consider myself very humble and I, I'm like but you're attacking me based off of my appearance and and you're like oh no he doesn't struggle and it's like almost like what I don't get to struggle with my mental health I don't get to talk about it because I you're assuming that I don't struggle with it because of the way I look and I just think that's ignorance and it is frustrating where it's like men sometimes aren't taken as seriously uh especially you know guys that have had some success by certain metrics and people go you can't complain like your life is good but yeah. you know mental health is all about a perception like no matter what i've experienced and what i have if i'm hurting i'm hurting and and if it if it's if it means something to me then it means something but that's where like people play this comparative game where they go you're you're good like there's you know like you're you have it better than this person this person this person well, it's like, well, maybe I do have more things than these individuals, but all I know is the life that I've lived and this causes me pain. So you invalidating it by saying you should be grateful for all that you've done and, you know, look at all the things you do have. No, you can't struggle. It's like, why can you tell me what I can and can't struggle with? Like, that's where it goes way deeper. But there's a lot of people that just with social media, it's all about who can get out the first word and who can say something while relevancy is still a thing. And so this is what you have. A lot of individuals that are just willing to step up to the plate and give their hot take because in a week from now, the time it'll take to actually do the research and, and, and be able to uh, be able to put out a, um, you know, an educated uh, response by then it's no longer relevant. So you have a crowd of people that are just like, I'm here to be relevant. I'm going to get my hot take. And that is just extremely destructive. Um, and their words do hold impact because next thing you know there's an article that comes out you, you know hope, you so and so disagree says this about clayton and now that person when they google me is going to see that and then they may form an opinion and go ah oh, this guy must be he must be a trouble you know troublemaker look at like what all these people are saying about him yeah and then you get that that bias that exists like you said mm -hmm. with just the hearsay now and we'll wrap up in a second here but i i just i think someone could look at this conversation just this last part and go oh two two white guys discussing mental health oh what do they yeah like you said they can but it's like this is the issue that exists is that there are everyone's got a unique set of hurdles they're trying to overcome and by you sharing what you've overcome and are overcoming that is inspiring to people that that might think oh if clayton doesn't have it all then maybe i'll feel a little less guilty that i'm going through my struggles that is what i just want to get out there with my whole story is like we all struggle and what you see at face value isn't always what really is occurring internally. And this is where the speech that I'm giving later today, it's, it's about checking in on, with your happy friends, quote unquote, happy friends, because just because somebody appears that they have it all or that they're happy, they may be hurting deeply internally. And I, and I, I always re reference a story about Twitch. You know, he was the DJ on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Um, and I don't know a lot about him, but, but this guy was apparently a very bubbly personality. He was dancing. And then all of a sudden, you know, he, he, he takes his own life and everyone was like, what? He seems so happy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that is a perfect example of somebody that was hurting deeply, but put on, you know, a mask and made themselves appear that everything was okay. And that's, what's so dangerous. And that's why it's so important that we open up and we're vulnerable and let people know that like, I don't have it all figured out. I do hurt. Like, and, and, and there's this, you know, it's tough because I do see right now, there's a lot going on right now. There's a lot of sensitive issues being brought up. And I will say this, like 
being a white man comes with privilege. Absolutely. There's mm -hmm. been a lot of privilege that I have been that, you know, that I didn't do anything to earn. It's just given, you know, there is privilege with being a white male in this, in society. There absolutely is. Um, but I think what happens is that, you know, people see that and then they, you know, say, okay, well, you have all this stuff given to you. And, and while some of that may be true, I'm like, yes, I am very, like, I did benefit, um, you know, by, by the color of my skin. Some people like they, they don't benefit because of the color of their own skin. And that's very, very unfortunate. Um, but with that, it's like, just even if I have privilege, it doesn't mean that I still can't have problems. It doesn't mean that I still can't be hurting. Yeah, your gene and, code and your limbic system don't know the difference. And, you... and at the end of the day, like I have feelings and thoughts too. And like, they should not be minimalized, you know, or minimized. They, they should, you know, be taken seriously, right? Like all of our mental health should be taken seriously. I, at the end of the day, I, I, it's, it's, if someone's hurting, they're hurting. And if it means something to them, then it matters. And like, that's, the lesson that I hope that people understand is like that I'm trying to spread is let's stop judging people based off their appearance, based off of, you know, what they've accomplished and like just see people for the emotional beings that we are and like just try to be there for people. And this, this society is all about comparison and who has what and who doesn't. And we're all flexing on Instagram. And it's like, what if we stop trying to compare and like one up people and just listen? Because like our culture is so look at me, look at me, listen to me, listen to me. And it's like, how about we turn it around and like listen to other people like that? We'd be so much better off if people just sat and gave someone, a, a, you know, an active, listening ear like well we uh, we had an audience that was listening to you right here that's for sure you know i asked i asked reddit and a few other places like what, what questions do you have for clayton mm -hmm. and a lot of people just wanted to say that they wanted to tell you that you got a lot of supporters out there and a lot of people that appreciate what you're doing so hey, look on behalf of them appreciate i want to i want to thank you for taking the time and is there anything else you want to say before i let you go because i don't want to take up too much of your time but i'm long-winded man i think i i said exactly what i needed to um you know that's that's one thing that I guess I can just say is, is with everything that I've been through, I'm, I'm super blessed and I really just try to perceive my life as a blessing. And, you know, because I have the choice whether to be happy or sad and like that ultimately is a choice. And so I just want people to know that I'm doing good. I feel like I'm on the up and up, even though people could be like, what, how this guy, feel? I feel like he's in the valley. I'm like, no, I've been in the valley, but this is just like, there's been so much growth that has come from this. And I just want to say, you know, thank you to you for sticking your neck out there um, because most people didn't. Like I've taught, I had conversations with people and they're like, I really don't want to put myself out there. I don't. You, uh, you owe my wife a rose. <laughs> I'll give her one. Her. <laughs> I'll absolutely give her okay. one because you know, she, again, like you did not have to, but you did. And, and you were willing to put yourself out there in harm's way. And I really appreciate that because like my voice can only carry so far. And I want to say thank you to all the people online that have defended me and have, you know, done this investigation. They've dug up things. It's, it's helped me because when you're in a dark place, at least if you have people around you, you feel less frightful because you're like, I know there's people around me in this dark room, so at least I'm not alone in this. And going through and being The Bachelor, there's only 26 other guys or whatever that have ever been The Bachelor. I feel alone very often because there's not many people that can relate to me. And so the more times that I can feel surrounded and, and supported, it really helps get me through these troubling times. So I just want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to everyone that's listening, willing to sit here and, and listen to me speak and like support me that without the support, um, you know, that I, I wouldn't be able to have the resiliency that I do. I of course. can't do this on my own. Of course. Final question. Who plays you in the Clayton Eckerd Lifetime movie? Because we had people saying maybe a Helmsworth, maybe the <laughs> unknown Helmsworth brother, a distant Wahlberg, maybe. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I got my, I got my, I would love for The Rock, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I got so much. I think that guy's incredible because he's just so humble for being so well known, and he does so much good. And he's a good example, yeah. Uh, I don't look anything like him, but but you know, but I, I, I try to match his muscle, but he still blows me out of the water. But, Dude, thanks again, yeah, man. Absolutely, really, really appreciate. Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And I hope you understand why I had to take some of it out and just be the first to know if you subscribe to this channel, you will be the first to get the remainder of that conversation up. I will have lawyers look at it. And as we progress through the court system, the right time and place will come where we get to share it with you. Again, trust me when I say this. I've been overwhelmed by all of the donations and support. It has been life changing for my family. 
that you guys have all been a part of this journey for me. And some Driving With Dave episodes might be a little more fun than others, but I think there's always something to be learned from them. Go on now, have a good day. And if you're seeing this still, tomorrow, I'm gonna release my one year anniversary vlog on my vlog channel. You can click right over there and catch that out. Subscribe to the vlog channel. And we're gonna have a little special surprise over there for you. Okay, okay, <laughs> I have to show you this. I, wa I was driving through Arizona and I have this little drone and I said, I wanna get the perfect quintessential driving with Dave shot in the middle of the countryside with these beautiful cactus and you're about to see what happened. Now I'm gonna talk you through it. I have my drone on a tracking device, which means it is set to my car. It is supposed to travel sideways with my car, uh, which would avoid those wires. Uh, but, oh no, oh no, ah! That's right, my drone died. I crashed my drone. What a tough week for Dave. Pray for that drone. Actually, I bought some replacement propellers for 20 bucks and it looks like, fingers crossed, it still works. No, uh, no true damage, hopefully. But I uh, hope you enjoyed that beautiful shot. And here's another beautiful shot of a cactus. <laughs> you guys earned it. <laughs>